Let's go. Hello and welcome to MMA Uncaged. This is episode eight, proudly brought to you by Ginger Fox Coffee. Check out gingerfoxcoffee.com, guaranteed to make you as clever as a fox. Now, this weekend, UFC Fight Night, it was the last one at the apex for the time being before we head to Yas Island for Fight Island, which is going to be something else. But we were treated to something special. And joining me, as always, are MMA royalty in South Africa, Gareth Soldier Boy McClellan and Justin Ferrier. Guys, let's start off. I mean, Justin Poirier against Dan Hooker was an absolute war and a treat for fight fans. Gareth, let's start with you. What are your thoughts? Because when five rounds eventually had to go down to decision, but what a war of attrition. It was just a treat to watch. Still doesn't understand the mute button. <laughs> the mute button <laughs> gets the him mute every button. time. <laughs> Still technical difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Gareth. Thanks, uh, th- thanks for joining us. Sorry, I paused there, guys. Sorry, I was on pause. <laughs> I was on yeah. pause. Uh, but what did I? What did I say? Listen, guys, we're gonna we're gonna get to an understanding that this potentially could be a big problem through the whole the whole time that we do this. That I have an inability to unmute myself. <laughs> See us to just to control the muting. No, I should actually listen, from my side. I, I, I did. I did. I did say could potentially be a fight of the night. Potentially one of the best fights we ever watched and. As far as I'm concerned, what I've seen this year, it's definitely the best fight of the year. Um, and we've had some humdingers. Uh, I called it. Don't say you called it. I called it. What are you talking about? You I just it. said I'm... Dustin Poirier. I, in fact, we, we've actually got proof. I said Dustin Poirier because he spent so much time in the light. I 100% called it. No, nah, but he, you could, I, don't, I don't think you could say and that's that. That's what brought him through. I think it just... <laughs> I'm going to claim what I can. I've got nothing. I can only claim what I can. <laughs> I claim it, I, claim it. At the end of the I day, I mean, you, you spot on it. Uh, vicious power hands landed by, uh, by Poirier over 25 minutes. And I think those were, were the telling blows. I think, I think Dan Hooker showed it an amazing chin, um, but just, just, just took too much damage. He took too many on the chin that were fresh and clean. And no matter how good you are and no matter how... Uh, how composed you can be and how good the legs are, it's, eventually it's going to take its toll. Also, bro, you had a weird kick. It, was, it, it, looked, it looked like it wasn't effective, yet it was effective. He was like doing like a, like a half volley. It was the weirdest kick that he was throwing. That is damaged, like isn't it? Not a, 100% like a, he was working. Yeah. It's more like a slap kick and not even a... Yeah, it was, and it was like a straight toe kick. I don't know, but yet it yeah. worked. But... So I, I tell you, I tell you what I saw. I watched the fight and I was like, "Cool." Obviously, the judges had it the first two to hangmen, and I was like, "And I, like I said, and I, I'm not blowing smoke up my own ass, but it was, it was his experience and his time in the light that kept me through because he lost the first two according to the judges, and then came back roaring in the last three. Yeah, I just well, found I his thought, rhythm, didn't I, he? I thought it was different. And that's time in the sun. Yeah, I you thought, thought what? I thought it was definitely, uh, in my, my book, I thought it was 1-1 one, one going into the third. I thought that uh, Poirier definitely took the second round. Um, good combinations. Good. Uh, you saw in the clinch how he fired out of that clinch. Good rapid body shots to the top and then up again, bringing it up. Good hooks, uh, shovel hooks up to the top hook and then finishing off with that left or right. His switch, his ability to switch and still punch through the switches. He's quite incredible in the fact that he can generate so much power and still have that snap behind the punch. One, of the, one, of, the judges, one of the judges scored it at 10-8, one of the rounds, because it was 48-46. Yeah, that's right. So one of them gave, one of, one of them gave uh, Poirier a 10 round. What did you make, uh, Jay, of the, the fight? I mean, you did call Poirier because of his experience. Uh, what did you make of the fight? Because... It was, it was a real treat. And, and fight fans, if you're new to the game, if you're a purist, you really would have enjoyed those five brutal rounds. I don't think it was a cardio thing. Sometimes you can blame it like guys will blow after their first two. 
it being a five round fight, I don't think it was a cardio thing. I think it was an experience thing. I mean, it was well matched that fight. Uh, in my opinion, I saw I saw Hangman taking the first two. The judges agreed with me. Gareth saw something differently, and but one of the going going the distance, one of the judges scored it at 10-8 for Dustin. I think the difference was the experience and the fact that Dustin Poirier didn't throw a jab. Every punch he tried to kill him. It was yeah. those power shots and they were deathly straight. And when they landed, it, were, it hurt. There was no... The, the, for me, the difference was uh, Hangman did a strange kick, which worked, but Dustin was trying to clean take his head off and Hangman was jabbing. It was a, there was a straight, a straight shot and there was a little switch chance there. And he would, every time he'd fire a straight off the switch in it. And you yeah. saw, you I, set, I, you I saw Dan was... Hooker's face afterwards. I mean, it just shows the damage that was, was inflicted by Poirier. It was, it was unrelenting. I think this is uh, one of Dustin's strengths is he has an exceptional ca- cardio. He's, uh, he has the ability to throw very hard for, for long periods of time. He's shown this before. He th- he's shown it in his interim title fight where he was able to continuously throw that power left. Um, he, he did exceptionally well on controlling the space through that switch punch, uh, both on the left and right side. Again, those punches were incredibly quick and they were on target. I mean, if you looked at the stats of his target, I think he was 72% as opposed to Hooker being 54 and, and uh, 50, 45, between 45 and the 50s. And, and the thing about Dan Hooker, he's been able to impose himself behind that jab and use that jab to control fights and pick guys off. Dustin did an incredible job about disrupting that space and not allowing him to get comfortable with his distance, pushing him on the back foot, stepping off to the side. He almost used a kind of like a wrestling movement uh, through in some of his punches in terms of the way it was short, quick steps, um, almost like as if he was walking down the road. Uh, highly effective. Um, and, and of course, when, you, when you're landing devastating punches with that kind of power... Um, it, it really starts to take its toll. And you saw that as the fight mounted through. Mm. Round, round one, Hooker was exceptionally quick, well in control, controlled the range. Two, it started to change. There was a few combinations in the in the clinch to where uh, Poirier really offloaded in terms of attacking the body, um, which he did exceptionally well, bringing those up top. And he landed some powerful hooks. And, and, and it was... A combinations of six, seven, eight, and nine uh, in in those clinch spaces, and that kind of just broke him down slowly over the period of time. Fourth round, uh, you saw Dan starting to shoot for the takedowns. He was quite successful towards the end of the fourth round, and then in the fifth, he had a few few takedowns himself. So, do you, do you not think? And this is this is a half question and a statement. I'll liken it to you fighting. Who was that guy from Shoshanguve that was always flat-footed and planted his foot down? Well, I am Tumela Maputa. Tumela Maputa. Yeah, that's and right. He, yeah. It looked to me from watching that fight, looked to me like he didn't play to the game plan that you had prepared for. And how I saw you change in that fight after the first round, you were like, I've got to adapt. Is it not a similar scenario that Dustin was like, I've got a strong corner that's saying I'm not, I'm, I, and I feel I'm not winning the first two. Are you, in, in experience, are you able to adapt within the fight and have a plan B and a place to go? Is it some, not something like that could, that could have happened? Yeah, look, I think you, you, you look at him and you look at Dan Hooker as well. I mean, these guys have had 30, 30, 30 to 40-odd professional fights. They've... They've been in there with the best in the world. They've uh, experienced pretty much everything that can be thrown at them. So the ability to, to chop and change on a dime is, is probably the biggest asset of a 5-1 to one, uh, fighter. When you start looking at their top five rankings, those guys have the ability, although they drilled for months on end in terms of... Uh, a game plan, if it's not going to plan, they have the ability to change. I don't think Dustin changed much up. I think he just controlled the space better. I think in rounds one and probably maybe two towards the first half of two, he was in control of the range. 
uh, uh, Hooker was. Hooker was the one that kept him behind that jab. That silly little front, snappy front kick, boop, and then that which would attack the calf and the shin um, a lot of the time. It's just very disruptive. It's something that's not effectively going to break anything. When I, but saw, when, I saw, when I saw what happened was it would push Dustin off balance, but Dustin would use it as a switch and then fire off the switch. So yeah. he was, yes, like you said, controlling this place really well. Well, right, I, think so that, I think that's something that Dominic Cruz definitely brought light to was that yeah. he, he was firing so fast off that low kick that as soon as he felt that low kick touch him, it was either that step through left hand, step through right hand, whatever it is that he needed to touch him. And, it, and you, you, what you don't understand as psych, psychologically, when you're in the mix and you're throwing, although you're taking, you might take a big body kick or you might take something to the side of the head that you defend, that you defend but, but that quick reaction and then landing it on the money, is it gives you confidence. Okay, well, he didn't hurt me with a kick, but I, t I touched him. He knows now that he doesn't have that ability just to, to be lazy there. And, uh, and Dustin's work rate showed that he wasn't lazy and he capitalized. He never, he never took one and stepped back and went, oh, okay. He never accepted anything. He responded in the best way possible. Certainly a fight of the year contender along with Whaley Zhang against uh, Joanna John Jacek. And of course, the guy that you love, Gareth, Josh Emmett against Shane Burgos, we saw recently. Those are three of the, the fight of the year contenders. I mean, but I think this Poirier hooker fight could just take it, don't you think? Well, I think it's the level of the names that were in there. I think jo Joanna and, uh, and Yang are going to be a very hard fight to beat. I think that was one of the most exceptional uh, shows of endurance, ability, toughness, toughness heart. Um, on, on a woman level, I think it was kind of the fight... Yeah, I would kind of liken it to the fight of, of Forrest Griffin and, uh, man, what's his name back in the day? Uh, they were the first ultimate fighter, uh, Stephen Bonner. Bonner. Yeah, and, and, and they kind of had that, they had that slugfest and it kind of was like, bang, that's the fight. I mm. think in the women's world, I think this is the fight when everybody goes, you know, like can really identify with the fact that women are just as capable as what men are. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, paydays, I mean, you got Poirier walking away with 300,000 US. Uh, Dan Hooker got his 110,000 US. Mike Perry, which is an interesting one. We'll talk on that just now. I mean, he got a win bonus. 180,000 US he's walked away with there. I mean, there's some, uh, some big earners. You know, they've done well for these guys. And it just shows, like, you put on a fight, you get rewarded. And that's something the UFC has done very well over time. And, I mean, Justin, you think about it, 300,000 US dollars, that's not a bad for a five-round war. We'll take that any day. Is it really? No, I, 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 for me, I think that they should get more always. I wish that the UFC was in a position, and obviously we're in an economic crisis, but I wish it was uh, $30 million or three, or, uh, let's be real, $3 million. Sure. I always think they should earn more, but yes, it is better than working a construction job. Yes. Yeah. So 150, he got paid and then 150 for his win bonus. So that's 300 K at the end of the day. Okay. But hang on. Is it, is it, is that really what that fight was worth? Was well, it really? What, do, do, they must give them money. They must give them money. Not think, do we not think that this is the stage where UFC combats all the nonsense that is going on at the moment and goes, you know what? Here's an extra, here's an extra for what you guys did. Because the reality is they have to show for the TV crowds. There's yeah. no full crowd in the stadium. There's no seats in the, in the stadium. They need to ensure that they keep the networks happy with great fights that they're producing, and that's what these guys are doing. You've got to stick your hand in your pocket, and you've got to start making them feel worth it because quite easily you could lose a Dustin Poirier to a NFC or a Bellator, Bellator or whatever, or whatever yeah. the case is because they're willing to pay the money. Sure. You know, Gia, I think it's such a such a contentious thing, bro. It's like, uh, think of it as a business owner and then think of it as an employee. Yeah. And take the fairness out of it because you think about, okay, yes, they should and, they would, and I would like to think that Uncle Dana would if he could. The problem is now there's no work. 
very limited work for these guys. So they will take it everything. And the, the problem is that there's 10 guys waiting in the line. Maybe not Dustin Poirier is a top five, et cetera, but, but look down the card. And, uh, you know, you, you, you praised, the, they pre, we praised the main event. They are worth, listen, I've never fought. I fought one fight. I have so much respect for people that put their bodies on the line. I, I believe they should be paid all more, but it's got to be a realistic goal of what are you worth. Retroactively, retrospectively, when you look back and hindsight's always twenty twenty, you see great fight. Da, 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 da. Fight of the year contention. Yeah. yeah. You, UFC then should write a little check and say, here's another 500 because you made us a talking point on every podcast around the world. I agree with that. But you look further down the card and you go, uh, Maurice Green, the big tall guy who's like eight foot tall and got an 80 inch reach advantage versus a guy it's called Guillaume Bianta. Exactly. It's and it's like, exactly that the guy. I, I, I feel, and yes, he's, he's, he, he deserves to be paid a concert, but he, he didn't deserve the platform. Because there are so many people out there that work so much harder than a fat like heavyweight. Look at him, bro. Like this is it. And, I, and I, I can fat shame because I'm a fat dude. So <laughs> like, I look at it and I go, I think it's just like the UFC I scraping. I think, it's, I think you come underprepared, you're disrespecting everybody, disrespecting the sport. Sure, so, but let's put it into context here. It's down to money, right? At the end of the day, right. Maurice Green knew he had one fight left to save his UFC career. He did it. Mm. He got himself 60,000 US. Now he can move to a new gym. He moves his family. You saw the interview afterwards. The guy was in tears, what it meant to him. Yeah, you know, and, I understand. And, and, I understand the buddy. That size. He's, why is he moving gyms? Why is he moving gyms? On, on, and then I read a very interesting article the other day, and this is, I'm not take, adopting their opinion, but I'm taking, I, I read it, and they were, it was highly critical of Jackson Wink, which I don't agree with because I think they're an amazing gym. But they were like, they turned him in the three weeks that they had him into a point fighter. Whereas he was, he was much bigger than the dude and he should, have, he should have just gone and then steam trained him. But what actually happened was a submission came. It was just the guy's lungs came out. Yeah. He, Maurice Green was on his back and he had not even a submission. There was nothing and there was a, I mean, you had... Uh, Dominic Cruz saying, oh, maybe you had the knuckle in the throat. And I'm like, there's no Ezekiel no. anywhere near there. You know what I mean? No. It's, it was, it was a poor time. show. And it shows that they might spend a little bit of money and, and have a good main event, but the rest of the card is lacking because they're betting the stock. I look uh, at Gian, listen, yeah. Gian Vilante, I, was, he was the guy that got submitted because he just was not fit. He took the fight on short notice. And, exactly. And, and then it. they said they're trying to make excuses for him. Maybe he had a, a knuckle and throat, which is basically a, a no-gi Ezekiel. No, he was fat and he was tired. Yeah, he was. This goes back to my, my point again, is that these are some professional fighters and they need to be, act like professionals. You look at the kid did that the fight did the, fir the first fight on the main card. You looked at uh, 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 Woodson versus um, Erosa. Uh, that okay, Rosa, they called him on Wednesday. Yeah. Hi, you want to, hi, would you like to fight? We have a fight for you. Yes, I'm in. Yeah. But because I'm so prepared and ready for any opportunity that I can get, I'll take it. Yeah. And, and, and he went. And he battled. He really struggled against a, a really technical striker who is very elusive and does really funny things, but stuck to his guns and he started to wear that guy down. He started to beat him up and eventually finished him with a an unbelievable submission yeah. to hit a dos from that from that level uh, standing up when you're tired when there's uh, when you're sweaty and to finish the way that he did is world class and is, he deserves everything that he gets going forward but it's because of professionalism that he put himself in that position I for me I'm sorry I, I, I could never as a coach allow my fighter who was a light heavyweight to walk in there fat and overweight I would turn the fight down yeah, I wouldn't. I, I'd be like, I'm sorry, this is not worth any money. Yeah, but not I mean, worth fifty dollars. Aren't a these guys thing. desperate for money? That's why he let the fight. He's like, cool. Here's my ticket. Yeah, it's a great. It, it, it's it it's a great, a great area. area. It's not a great area. It's a situation of if you're a professional fighter, nothing like I I, I follow J, JT Base on for as an example on Instagram. I don't have. I've had a few conversations with the kid because we both got French or bulldogs. He's a respectful guy. Enjoy him. He. From what I saw on Instagram, didn't have much going. There was a lockdown. Him and his wife trained every single day. Without fail, he'd run. She went away to fight. He couldn't corner her. He would run. Put his work in and he would document it every day. And you see this because 
That's what Instagram is about. It's, it's sometimes can be a lie, but if you're showing Instagram stories of what you've done on Strada or whatever tracking system you've got, the kid stayed ready. Now he's going to go get a third chance on the Dana White's contender series. Is it a Amazing. third chance? I think it is. But that's the point. Professionalism, staying ready. No, I, I agree. You, you, I can't, mean, you can't. I'm sorry. You, you, you should be. He looked terrible. Like, uh, yeah. I wouldn't. If, if I was in charge of that person, I wouldn't allow them. He, he looked like he just walked out from the kitchen somewhere. You know what I mean? Or he yeah. was looking after cars. Or well, this is this is the problem, and I know, and it's and it's and it's not a nice thing to say, but sometimes people have to speak the truth. You. you a coach must direct for the best decision for your fighter. And you must listen to your coach. I disagree. The responsibility of being a professional doesn't, does not fall upon the coach. You as an athlete need to be responsible. And if you cannot be responsible, then don't compete. Because you only let yourself down when you get in there and you underperform. or You, not even a, you don't even think it's a fail safe, bro. No, yeah, man, just to keep you on the straight and narrow at I, least. I, 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 I'm with you. I, I think that a coach... I know that it's, yeah. I think that a coach is good. I think a coach is an excellent person to have around, to mentor and guide you. But as an athlete, you need to be responsible for yourself. Do you want to be I won't disagree with I won't disagree with you there, G. But you I, think as a fail safe, as a fail safe, surely your you coach should be, listen, I'm not enjoying this. If they get the call, you would have had a manager or a coach and they would have presented the fight to him and he would the right way is to speak to his coaches and if he can't see it himself. This coach should have said, no, bud. This is not in your best interest. Are you obliged to present the fight to the fighter as a coach and an agent? Or can you both go like, listen, you know? I don't do think there's to? any. I've managed a couple of fighters. Uh, I've always been given my two cents. Um, but, there should be, but there's not always. It's up to the fighter because his life is on the line. Yeah. Most managers will take as a paycheck for themselves. So, yeah. They're um, looking after them. Yeah. Well, it brings me to the next point. I mean, we spoke about Mike Perry earlier. How important yeah. is a corner? You know, because Mike Perry, it was his girlfriend who cornered for him. I mean, he's a bit of a weird dude, fair enough, with uh, some weird ink. But at the end of the day, he said he did it because he didn't want to pay his cornerman and he wanted to keep more money. What do you guys make of that? Ask, I'll let Gareth answer that because he's been there. Yeah. Listen, so I, I, think, I think Mike Perry is a different cat. I think he doesn't, he doesn't care about... Uh, he breaks the mold. Yeah. yeah, he doesn't care about what it is. He knows his potential and he knows what he's capable of. And he went in there and he backed himself 100%, which at the end of the day is what you want from a fighter. You want him to back himself and you want him to put his hand up and say, okay, well, I'm going to do this thing. I don't need anybody. That's what a fighter should be able to do. You should be prepared and trained enough to climb in at any stage. That's what it's about. That's what being a professional it is. Uh, it is. Um, some guys need that reassurance. They need a coach. They need somebody to give them guidance and uh, a direction in the fight. I think he had already made up his mind what he was going to do, and he was just going to go out and fight. Wherever the fight went, he was willing to go. Um, is it the smartest I thing? It, Probably I, not. I see, it, I see it as a team sport, and I know it's an individual achievement, etc. And then you going out there putting putting your life on the line and your body on the line. And that's why you get the spoils of war. However, I do think that you are much stronger in numbers. And that's in anything, in any combat, in any war. It's better to go to war with four bullets instead of one. Because there might just be something. There might be something that person, that, that, that person in that corner can give you. And it might be the simplest thing of just rem reminding you to breathe. Mm. I think it, you, you increase your odds by having a good corner. But you can't have a bad corner because that's going to make your fight really great. But if you listen to him he, he, in what he said, he was like, you know, just have, having her there in my corner reminded me of what I was fighting for. So, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe, maybe that's all it is. Maybe that's all a fighter actually really needs, to, really needs at the end of the day is the motivation. 12 months of preparation or six months or three months or four months or whatever the case is that you put in for that fight, there's the amount of drilling and preparation that goes into it. And that mechanically gets programmed into your body. So it's going to happen anyway. Uh, some guys need a cue. Some guys don't. Some guys don't listen to their corner. They carry on and then they'll take the information in the middle of the corner. 
he was completely relaxed like he, he had done it a thousand times before you know they were having you know a little bit of back and forth conversation and, and he and he performed again although I, I do believe that mickey Gould is just not of the same level as him definitely not Definitely. On the ground, maybe, but no yeah. nowhere near in the striking cross. Yeah, but he, but he got taken down twice or three yeah. times, and he didn't really do much from there. So I, I, I think there's a big jump in, in competition uh, for, for Mike Perry uh, standing in front of a, 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 go, a goal opposed to a top five uh, UFC fighter. I think then it will become very different. I think it becomes inches in, the, in those really top-end fights. And you need somebody who can see those inches. So, but are you, even in terms of preparation, how are you going to prepare with that? You know what I mean? You need even technical sparring. You can't just yeah. hop around. You've got to have some structure. Even if it's a little bit, there must be something. But I think he I, I did have story, coaching, though. Story, just, just sorry, just hold on. I'll tell you a story. Uh, a guy like Norman Vessels never, mm. ever warmed up, ever for a single fight. Never warmed up. Sat in the corner with a blanket over him, and that's how he made himself warm up. The he never warmed the, up. Never. Wow. So it's each guy has their own trigger. They have their own switch. They have. But, their own but he would have a very very strong corner. It was you, Neil, Richie? Yeah. He didn't always listen to his corner. But, uh, mad, man. <laughs> let me let me ask you this gareth yeah. what goes into you know uh, your corner obviously your coach is staple but do you have like guys that you know you will take to war that will go with you and when you select your corner when you put it together how does that work take us inside to that decision especially when you're preparing for a title fight well i think you need to if one you need to have people in there that can uplift you um uh, one uh, the second thing is you also don't need yes men. You need people who can be brutally honest with you at the right time. 100%. And I'm not afraid to tell you what you need to hear. You've uh, lost this round. You need to up your game. Yeah. yeah. Um, they're also not scared to offend you or, oh, he's the fighter. He, you know, you need, you need a strong corner. You need a responsive corner. For me, I, um, I, I had a really good corner in terms of their response and, how they uplifted me in, 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 in the fight. They knew how to get me going. They knew what, what specific calls or directions uh, lifted, uh, lifted my heart rate up and got me pushing harder. They also knew what, to, to, or what cues to give me to slow me down and kind of get me to relax and, and, and take my time. And, and that's vitally important coming into title fights and championship fights. Um, lower down when it's a little bit crazy and it's a, it's a little bit high-paced and... You just need somebody who can manage you within the corner and at, at that, that, that minute break and can give you right direction. Um, but definitely as you climb the ladder and, and definitely as soon as you start getting into title contention, championship material, and then title defenses, you need a, a corner that's incredibly effective. I take a guy like George Hampier. You look at his corner, was Faraz. Um, sometimes it was John Denner. Um, but he picked guys with that were intelligent, that that knew how to communicate with him in the corner, and people he respected, so that when he got um, information or he got given commands, he responded because he respected those commands. You definitely can have can't have somebody in your corner that you don't trust. You don't that is. A subordinate, or somebody who's too, or, or, or someone who's too emotionally well, attached. I, 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 I've seen guys crumble. Like I, it, having people, having girlfriends in their corners, not a new thing. It's happened before, and I go, guys, come on now. She loves you so much, she doesn't want you to get hurt, and that's her first thing. So uh, I've seen that, right? Like in in fights, and then and and in, in in amateur fights, even you go, come on, man, you need you need somebody who's going to be able to separate and be serious. Yeah, look, I think it's, you guys got to understand we're in a position where uh, uh, you put your life on the line, you can get seriously injured, and you, you can't really take, you can't take it lighthearted. You need to ensure that you're 100% always putting your best, best foot forward. Again, professionalism. Yeah. How do you respond in a profession? But it goes back to the conversation of we not get paid enough. 
we, we're struggling. We're struggling to, to, to maintain. We're struggling to fly guys across the country. You know, uh, restrictions, things that are happening, uh, COVID, it's, everything's not what it was before. No, no fans in the crowd. So how can you go and say, hey, well, you can't have... That's mind-blowing. Some guys feed off the crowd. Yeah, you, you can't have your wife in the corner because uh, it's kind of not ethical or it's a bit stupid or retarded or you're going to get injured. But everything else that a fighter has been has used to energize him and level up is not there anymore. You know, I, I hear you. I hear you. I think, you I think in, in terms of the unprecedented times we have at the moment, it's kind of like a weird area for everyone at the moment. Who would have ever thought you would have had a UFC event, UFC 250 without fans? For, you know what I mean? All these fight nights. Yeah. So yeah. unprecedented times. Gents, we are running out of time and we could talk on this forever. Um, but one thing I wanted to quickly ask you about, uh, Takashi Sato um, is a guy that they almost, pinning the big Japanese hope on him. Do you think like he is the, the, the type of guy that could sort of restart uh, the, the, the Japanese MMA scene? I mean, they've the long history, long events, that sort of thing. But, you know, he comes in there and, and he almost has this like pressure to suddenly perform each time he fights. Or what, what do you guys Big think? pressure because it, it all starts off like on, on, on uh, TV deals. So they will want to expand into an, an area and they will they'll go, in a nutshell, they will pick a guy that's the best chance of succeeding. They'll, there'll be more than one. One act will put his hand up and shine, and then there is a hell of a lot of pressure on him to shine. I mean, just the Japanese as a nation are very proud. So he, he would have a lot, of, a lot of pressure on him from his family, his friends, his training camp. Um, do I think he's got it? He's made it so far. I think... I think from my from, from 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 my aspect, I think that like when I got signed to the UFC, and uh, UFC were desperately trying to break into the, the South African African market, and they had kind of pinned me to be the guy that did that, and uh, everybody was excited in the UFC, and there was there was a lot of a lot of talk, and there was a lot of buzz around me, and you know Dana was Dana was tweeting about me, and there was just kind of this real vibe that that these things and you and it and it becomes incredibly pressured. It does. You all of a sudden you're walking there, you're carrying the whole nation on your back because the whole nation now wants us to be successful in the UFC. Um, you feel like you don't want to let anybody down. You let you letting you know by losing or not not performing, you let UFC down. You let your team down. You let your family down. You let your friends down. You let the nation as a whole down. So. Yeah, look, I mean, he's definitely carrying a large weight on his shoulders by, uh, by the talk and, and, and what's going on. But he's a performer. I mean, he walked in and one minute into the fight and it was over. Um, uh, that, that, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of start you need or that's the kind of results you need to get at this stage when you're making that climb of the ladder and you go, okay, you know what? I can beat these guys. You know, a good knockout. And you'll probably find his next fight's going to be a tough fight. They're going to give him somebody who's a lot tougher. They're going to give him somebody who's going to push him harder. They're just going to keep testing him. He's never going to stop getting tested. And if as soon as he takes one step back, he's going to get thrown with a bigger name to say, well, okay, you fell now, but can you recover? Can you show us that you're worth, you're worth uh, the pennies that, uh, that are going to get thrown behind you? And, and, and Japan, yeah. I mean, Japan is where mixed martial arts started. It was the... It was the it, it was the ground pride. It was, it was the epicenter of uh, uh, mixed martial arts. So um, you see now that if they can get a big name, big Japanese name in the mix, that can create a stir for them in Japan, they can definitely get uh, um, a solid footing there. Justin, you see how excited Gareth is about this, this Japanese influence here. That has yeah, to grab the, the mic and get nice and close. And All right, uh, <laughs> gentlemen, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for your time. I mean, uh, there's so much we haven't even spoken about, um, but we'll definitely be catching up. We've got a Fight week. Fight Island. Fight Island coming to a theater near you. Fight Island. Oh, I mean, Fight it's Island. Kamaru Usman against yeah, Gilbert Burns. I would Burns love, to, I would love to fly there. It would be incredible. I think I'm just going to, I think I might, I might rent a little, little, little Cessna 
or a little king air and uh, fly low over Africa. Into, well, Justin, uh, I might just go swimming. You, uh, Justin, you're in Durban on the East Coast. You might as well start swimming. Man. <laughs> I'll stop swimming. It's going to be incredible. I think, that... you, I, I think we get, there's going to be bigger fight purses there um, because of the hype around it. And there's going to be better paid because they've saved all the big names for this fight island because they need to recover from the losses. And uh, also, there might be a little bit of oil money there. Well, there's three uh, title fights. It's mad. It's mad. I think, I think we are going to be in for the most amazing week of UFC you're ever going to watch. Yeah, I, I think, uh, what, what, what's the other one? What's the other title fight again? Uh, what the, what's the Jan against uh, uh, Aldo? Oh, yeah. I you think I think, it's, I think it's time for Aldo to, to really stamp his, his greatness as an as a MMA fighter. I, I, I would love to see him win and then bow out and say thank you very much. Yeah, I think it might Absolute be legend. Uh, absolute legend. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, Gareth, we've got uh, good news regarding our MMA Uncaged social media handles. Uh, I know we've got uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, you can follow us on MMA Uncaged Fight Club. Uh, at, that's the, the handles for all three pages. We're up and running now. We're going we're gonna to be putting on some fantastic content. Give us a follow. Uh, spread the love. Spread us around. Gareth loves the Facebook, uh, huh? Hey? He's not scared. Not scared. Gareth loves Facebook. the Facebook. Let's get loves for the, the, loves the, loves the picture. Eh? Social, Gus. I'm a social guy. At <laughs> Soldier Boy Inc. At Soldier Boy Inc. At Justin Ferrier yeah. on Insta. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. I should yeah. know by now. I should know yeah. by now. Yeah. All right. Next time we chat, we will dissect Fight Island. What's happening there? Thanks very much for listening, watching, like, and share, and uh, yeah, give us some feedback. We love to hear from you, and uh, hopefully, we'll have some uh, nice. Things to talk about next week when it comes to uh, maybe an interview with one or two UFC fighters. Who knows? We'll see what happens. But it's all coming up on MMA Caged. We thank you for watching and uh, we'll chat to you soon. Let's go. 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 This is for work. No surrender. No surrender. Yeah. Yeah. You know that this right here for work. Allow me to reintroduce myself, they call me J-O, aim to the easy E end <laughs> Know that we undefeated, y'all are beneath them speeds, it's trying to air a grievance But his lines are overhead, better check the air for clearance Call the tower, this is our critic, he the air apparent, uh -huh. Really, I've never been better, yeah. legacy, this is forever huh. All the more times I've been seven, I'm raising the bar, you can go ahead and measure yeah. Think about time for a toast, yeah. time that we welcome to go, yeah. y'all will just leave it at no yeah. Yeah. This right here forever